Recently, I sent out an email to my list asking my subscribers to ask me anything. Fill out a form and ask me any question that you want, and I may address that topic in an upcoming YouTube video. And I got lots of great responses, and one of the questions that I got asked a lot was how to deal with the high note fingerings on the bassoon, how to get better at them and more comfortable, because they get really tricky really quickly when you start getting into high note fingerings. So this video is in response to that general question that I got asked frequently. And if you have a question that you want to ask, remember, ask me anything. I'll link down to that form below if you wanna ask a question and see it possibly addressed on an upcoming video. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Natalie Law and I'm a professional bassoonist and teacher and I love to help people just like you learn and get better at the bassoon and feel confident playing this instrument. So I would love if you are subscribed to the channel, you give me a like and a comment and engage with the video because it helps other people who might benefit from this information, see this video as well. So let's talk about why high notes and specifically high fingerings on the bassoon are so tricky. You might notice that as you're going up the scale or up the range of the bassoon, you will notice that the fingerings are pretty simple. They, you, you lift a finger, you put down a finger, they're, they seem to make sense, they're sequential, like a lot of other instruments. And then when you hit about E flat, E above the bass clef staff, and on upwards, the fingerings get really weird. You start to add thumb fingerings, and you have forked fingerings, and you still have the half hole on some of those notes, and you're doing weird fingering combinations that don't feel natural. And the reason for this, and I'm certainly not a sound expert and wouldn't be able to explain all of the acoustical properties of the bassoon sound, but essentially, as you get into that higher range on the bassoon sound, there's less fundamental sound in those notes and there's more overtones. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, I would recommend looking up some videos on, on the overtone series. In every pitch, there's a fundamental of the pitch and then there's these series of overtones. If you came from a brass instrument or if you ever played a brass instrument, you know a lot about the overtone series because that has to do with how the partials work on brass instruments. But essentially, when you get into that upper range register of the bassoon, we have less of the fundamental pitch and we have more overtone series. And so there's more manipulations of the instrument in the fingerings that have to happen for that note to work. And that's also why in the range of the bassoon, unlike a lot of other instruments, we tend to get softer as we get higher in that really high register as opposed to in the low register of the bassoon where it's harder to play softer um, because in that high register, we're more in those overtone series. So let's talk about how we can actually get better at these notes. How do you learn these higher notes in the first place? You, you might be forced to learn them because you see a high F, a high G coming across in your music and you have to immediately learn that fingering. Now, before I dive too deep into the fingerings of the high notes, I do recommend you check out my high note video, which doesn't so much talk about high note fingerings as it does high, how to make your high notes sound good, meaning how do you have a good tone because it's very easy for those notes to sound very pinched and out of tune. And there's a lot of things that go on with your mouth basically and the way that you're using your air to help those high notes sound good. And in this video, I'm fo focusing more on the fingering technical aspect of those high note fingerings. So yes, there's many difficult things about high notes on the bassoon. You want to make sure that you get a good fingering chart. There are so many bad fingering charts out there that are in published books in band programs. If you go through a band program in middle or high school and you look at the fingering chart in the back of the book for bassoon, a lot of times there are incorrect fingerings and sometimes they don't even go that high. So you have to be careful about what fingering chart you're, use, you're using. I wouldn't just pick any random one off the internet without really researching who made it. Um, because there are a lot of bad fingering charts out there. Um, I will link down to my fingering chart below. It's a little bit different than what you might see with other standard fingering charts because there's actual pictures of the bassoon and shows you where they go because I feel like sometimes 
standard fingering charts are a little bit difficult to tell what finger corresponds to what hole and the diagram and all of that. So um, my fingering chart is more of a picture based fingering chart um, and they're fingerings that I use. So you know that they have correct fingering. So get a good fingering chart, make sure that you're using it because you can't possibly do well if you're not using correct fingerings to start with. So I would recommend expanding into the high register one note at a time. So for example, if the highest note that you can comfortably play, and when I say comfortably play, I mean if someone were holding a gun to your head and you had to play that the highest note that you could play, what would that note be? Not, oh wait, let me look at the fingering chart and remind myself what it is, but what can I comfortably play? And that high note may only be a C or a D above the staff, and then everything above that is kind of a gray area. And that's okay, but just kind of know that. So if you can comfortably play a D above the staff, then the next note that you're gonna learn is an E flat. And you wanna kind of learn one note at a time. You don't wanna just start learning all the high notes. Um, you wanna kind of incorporate them one at a time into your practice routine. So if the next note you're gonna learn is E flat, start incorporating E flat into your scales, which if you aren't already practicing scales, arpeggios, kind of basic technical exercises, I highly recommend that you get into those and I highly recommend that you check out my warm up video, which is the warm up routine that I use and I recommend for students to make sure that you're getting sort of a mini technical session every time you're warming up and you're actively practicing this stuff. This, when you're trying to build your range on the bassoon and trying to get more comfortable with fingerings, you just have to do them every day. There's no way around it. You just have to spend the time, you have to put in the labor to be able to get comfortable. It doesn't just happen overnight. So start incorporating these notes into your scales, especially incorporate them into long tones because when it comes to like voicing the high notes, that's a different thing than in the middle and lower registers of the bassoon. So knowing how, not only how to finger the high note, but how to make it in tune and with a good sound. So playing long tones on those high notes, like I mentioned in my warm up routine is a good way to get really comfortable with them. And so I would recommend if, if you're gonna go kind of one note at a time expanding your range, if E flat is your new note that you're gonna just try to get more comfortable with, spend a week incorporating it into your routine and then the next week move to E natural and the next week move to F and the next week move to F sharp. So spend a week just building that range so that if you imagine the gun held to your head again, that by the end of the week, hopefully E flat is gonna be the highest note that you can play at that point, right? So really take it slow. I know some people are like, I just need to learn all my high notes. If you take that approach, you're going to be frustrated. Just kind of gradually work it in. Make sure you have a solid warm up and technical routine built into your practicing no matter what you're doing. And that will help you build these skills. So that's how you kind of learn the note in the first place. And you might also be forced to learn these notes because you're seeing them in repertoire come up. Um, but also how to get faster at these notes. Because sometimes I think the issue with some students that I work with is not so much the fingering, they can figure out the fingering, but it's getting, it's learning the fingering quickly, getting it quickly, and then moving from other notes to that newer note. It's, it's being able to get it quickly. That's kind of the next hump to get over and getting comfortable with high note fingerings. And so here's a couple tips to get even faster. You know, obviously regular practice, incorporate it into your warm up routine, focus one note at a time, week by week. That's kind of the where you gotta start. Um, but here's some things that you can do to get faster at learning these notes. So going off the warm up routine that I mentioned before, and again, you might wanna go check out that video because this might not make sense to you without having seen my warm up routine video. But in that video, I mentioned how I have kind of a standard set of exercises and things that I work through in my warm up routine, but then I will sometimes throw in something specific based on what's going on. So um, 
if I'm working on a specific excerpt, I might do a specific exercises that is based around that excerpt and put it in my warm up routine. For you, if you're trying to learn high note fingerings, you will want to put specific exercises just for those high note uh, fingerings. You know, for example, when you do scales, arpeggios, long tones, and all that stuff, you're working in sort of the full range of the bassoon, and you want to hone in on the high register. So insert something into your warm-up routine temporarily to focus on these higher notes. Whole step trills are a good way to sort of hone in on a specific note and the notes around it, and to figure out that note sort of combination um, when you're going back and forth, which is, like I said earlier, is something that a lot of students struggle with. So a whole step trill, all it is, is that you play a note, any note, and then you trill it with the, no the note that is a whole step above it. So a whole step, in case you're a little rusty on some music theory terms, a whole step is two half steps. So if you're playing a C, you would do a whole step trill from C to D. If you're playing a B, you would do a whole step trill from B to C sharp because it's a, it's two half steps or a whole step. So just kind of keep that in mind. And you can do whole step trills on the entire range of the instrument. But if you're trying to learn high notes, you can isolate them in the high note register. And so start on the note that's the most comfortable for you, say maybe that D above the bass clef staff, and then you trill from D to E. And you don't just trail straight out the gate. You go slowly and then you build up um, your speed so that you can play them more quickly until it's basically a trail. Another drill that I like is a kind of a five note little figure drill um, that which is basically the first five notes of any major scale that you play and then you're doing, doing a little loop where you can keep moving up that scale. That's a good way you're going back and forth on a set range of notes and you're practicing those note combinations as well. So kind of similar to the whole step trills, it's just a little bit larger of a set of notes that you're focused on and it also kind of gets your mind in the mindset of keys as well so you're you're having to think about what's in the key of B flat major what's in the key of G major and so on When you're practicing scales, whether it be just straight up regular scales or you're doing some sort of special scale exercise, make sure that when you're practicing those that you stop and take time to fix anything that doesn't sound good in that scale. Maybe you can play that scale 99%, but there's 1% of the scale, maybe it's a certain note combination that's not super clean, or you can feel it's not super comfortable, maybe you get a little tense around that note combination, and that's where you wanna stop and you want to hone in on those note combinations. So this will happen with me a lot when I'm playing scales, is the first two octaves will be great, and then the top octave is a little messy, and so I'll have to stop and I'll do some exercises around that octave to help me practice those high note fingerings. And so I do things like I change the rhythm. So if I was playing a 16th note rhythm scale, I would change the rhythm to be something like different variations of triplets. So if it's if the rhythm is da 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 da, and this can go not just for scales, but any passage and music you can it doesn't have to be just a scale exercise but um, changing a, a set of 16th notes or a set of notes that are all the same value into triplets <laughs> I 
I'm putting the the sex tuplets at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the triplet, if you didn't catch that rhythmic variation there. But all I'm doing is I'm just changing the rhythm of what I'm doing and making my brain think about it differently and making different connections in my brain to be able to understand that rhythm. And so, are you, and you can also do things like swinging the scale. <laughs> That's a really great way to get um, comfortable with fingerings and take the time when you're doing your scales and your fundamental exercises to work on those things in that time. Another tip for getting faster and better at playing high note fingerings is to push yourself to play music that uses those fingerings. It's painful at first sometimes because it's like, ah, there's a lot of notes that I can't play, but just kind of forcing yourself to get into it, even if it's not comfortable yet, just accelerates the amount of time it takes to learn things. So make sure that you're regularly playing in some etude books. Some really common kind of good go-to etude books are the Weisenborn Method for Bassoon. That's one of the main go-to uh, books for learning the bassoon that has a lot of great exercises in it. Um, the Mildy Concert Studies and Scale Studies are another good set of books that are good to get into and they really test your range. If you're more of an advanced player and you've already kind of worked through a lot of the Weisenborn and Mildy, you might check out the Piard Etudes. Those etudes in particular really take you way up into the high register. Um, I think even more so than kind of the standard ones that we do first, you know, and even just pull out other different random etude books if you can and start playing around with those notes and force yourself to get into them, even though you're like, you know, I can't play this. Even if you're doing it at one hundredth of the tempo, it's still so much better than not doing it at all. So force yourself to play music that forces you to get into that register. One other point I wanna make about high note fingerings is to know when not to use them. So know your alternate fingerings, especially for these high notes, there's some alternate fingerings that you can use, especially for F sharp and A flat, and there's some other ones in there too, especially if you have to do trills or anything. There are definitely some situations that it's just impossible to use the standard fingering and you have to figure something else out. And so that's where you want to learn the alternate fingerings. And there's some fingerings that are kind of like your, your standard alternate fingerings. Like you've pretty much got to know them no matter what. And I have a video on alternate note fingerings um, that I'll link to above. And you can learn a little bit more about alternate fingerings in general, not just in the high register, but in throughout the register of the bassoon. Um, but knowing when not to use high note fingerings can make your life a lot easier because there are certain, certainly technical situations where it's just going to make more sense to use a more simplified version of a fingering, especially if it's very fast and you can't really hear the tone quality of the note. So knowing when not to use them is another good thing to think about when you're getting into these high notes. If this video was helpful for you, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and let me know down in the comments what sorts of questions do you have about high notes or what have you found to be helpful in learning the high note fingerings or what, are there any specific fingerings that you just feel like you can't get? I'd love to know kind of your thoughts on high note fingerings and thank you to those of you who asked me this question in my Ask Me Anything form. I love hearing from you and I hope that this answered your question and gave you some things to think about and work on in your practicing.